Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this community. I ask that you fill our hearts with your spirit, our minds with your words, so that we can serve you and join you in the celebration. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. In the readings just prior there are two that I want to lift up before I begin. Today, I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. This is one of the most famous of passages. And it has its own set of challenges, being so familiar, to talk about. So what I'd like to do is just lift up five or six points that show not only compassion, but also the length God's willing to go with that compassion and also with redemption. We see in the very beginning who this is pointed towards. Luke likes to alternate between the disciples and the Pharisees, but there really is no question. In the first three verses, we find out that it was the Pharisees that, and scribes that were grumbling and talking about Jesus eating, welcoming sinners and eating with them. And he begins with the parable. And in the beginning of this, it mentions something that probably until seminary I really never had picked up on and thought I would share with you today. That's right in verse 12. The son asks the question, and the father says, we don't know. But what he does is more important. It says he divided his property between them. So his older brother, as well as the younger brother, got their share. Now it's likely that the older brother would get two thirds and the younger a third. And we also see that the older brother stayed there with what remained and continued forward. But it's a in a sense, it's a compassion that's indirectly given to us. The father, being an elder in this culture, would not be inclined or required to do any of this. Secondly, in order for this young son to leave or to move on, he had to cash in on his inheritance. And again, during this period, wealth was gained in livestock and property. So it's very likely that in order for this transaction to take place, property of about a one third and the livestock had to be sold off completely and turned into transportable money of some kind, exchange. So this decision by the younger son didn't just impact the father and the family, it impacted everybody here and then. Everyone gets a bit of a cut based on this decision. And third, and really most importantly, after this cashing in and after this decision was made, culturally, the son is not just trying to show that he's gaining independence, that he's going off on his own, that he's making his own decisions. It's much, much more than that. Basically, in this culture, something like asking for an early inheritance was just not done. And in terms of what was actually being said by the son to the father is simply this. I wish you were dead. I want to separate myself from you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. I wish you were dead. Huge impact. The fact that the father was compassionate indirectly or directly and followed through on this is something of huge and devastating impacts beyond certainly the split of the property and the impact it would have on the family. It was a huge shame for the family, the father and everyone involved that he would do this. We skip ahead a bit where he goes off to the foreign land and after he spent all that he has and begins working, we find that 
there's a famine and he has needs. He's out of money, he's out of support. And the only thing he can do is to do day labor. And based on this time and this period, it's also really important to lift up that day laborers, as I'm terming them, basically work for hire by the day, were on the thinnest margin of society. These were literally the least and the last of them. Quite often, those people that were in that circumstance and situation were the ones that would die from disease, certainly, but most likely starvation. Because the other choice that this son had made was to go off to a distant land, likely a Gentile nation, likely at a time when social services and support systems were not the order of the day. Those that were left out on the edges that were feeding the pigs, another indicator that it's likely Gentile, were the ones that were on their own. So those, those words, and they gave him nothing, were very direct and very intense. And also when he said, I am likely dying, were also extremely accurate. He was most likely at death's door. But moving forward, we see this one passage that it says he came to himself. He had a revelation. It's interesting, in looking at some of the commentaries, that the only other time this word coming to yourself is used is when Paul has a revelation that he is to preach to the Gentiles. Two times in the Bible. This revelation of the Son in this example, and Paul going to the Gentiles. So he's, he's realized that he was at the bottom of the barrel, he's at the edge of, of society, he has nothing. And he starts to realize that that compassion that his father has shown is starting to come up not only with him, but also with those that worked for his father. You see, his father would treat the day laborers better than the situation that he's in. And here he is dying of hunger. So he's come to grips with this situation that he's in. And he makes a decision. He's going to repent. He's going to seek that compassion that his father would offer and go back and even to be the least, the thinnest edge, whatever example you may want to give, on the margin would be far better than the situation that he was in because it was likely leading to death. And the son, at this turning point, I believe was truly being authentic when, even though he rehearsed it in his head what he was going to say, that that was his intent, was just to simply go back and exist as part, whatever part of the family. As we see, moving forward around verse 20, the father has different plans. And these are three other points that I want to lift up because they're significant not only culturally, but as part of this parable. It's so well known, yet I think these speak volumes for the depth of compassion that's there. Verse 20 says, while he was still far off, his father was filled with compassion and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. First, while he was still far off. Significant because while this may be a large piece of property, there had to be some intention on the father's point. This wasn't happenstance. Ever since the son had left, there's some indication here, based on the fact that he saw him from far off, that he was looking for him. Even though he had shamed him, wished him dead, this father still spent days looking over the horizon, wishing and hoping that he could get his son back. Secondly, another cultural norm being somewhat broken, is it says that his father, while he was still far off, ran to him. Now, we've also, I've already discussed the shame involved in what's going on with an elder, a man of stature, a man of position, a man with a large piece of property. One of the other things that a man that's stately like this, one thing he did not do, he didn't run. It was not considered something that an older elder of the, of the group would do. Yet, he was not concerned with social thoughts, norms, 
society at all. What he saw far off was what he had been searching for, and that was his youngest son. And he ran to him. And although he was a day laborer who fed the pigs, again, unclean to about the nth degree, when he got close to him, he came up to him, he hugged him, he held him, and he kissed him. There were no barriers for this father. There was nothing that he wouldn't do, it seemed. Malnourished as he was, probably in a horrible state, based on the conditions that he mentioned near death, he holds him close. And as we see, the son's practiced thoughts begin to spill out from him. He begins to repent, and he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What's interesting is he didn't even address his son. He didn't even make an argument for or against. He simply realized that his son was lost, his son is found, and he was excited. He was happy, he was overjoyed, he was filled. So he doesn't even address the comment of the sons. He speaks directly to a slave and says, get the finest things, get him clothes, get him shoes, get him a ring. He reinstates him into the former position that he had walked away from, from the man who he had wished dead. And what the father's return response was, kill the fatted calf, it's time to celebrate. Just when you think everything's headed to the banquet and everything has gotten better, this amazing compassion, the repentance of the son, we're moving forward into the banquet hall. We're paused because the older son comes back into the picture. And we think we're going to reconnect and everything will be well because the elder has shown this compassion. And we note the son is out in the field, the elder. He's there. He doesn't notice anything. And he calls to one of the slaves. I want to lift this up because I think it's also important to note we're not out of the woods yet in this story, but it's also the fact of the actions of this elder son. Now we learned in verse 12, he had inherited everything that was there. Respectfully, his father was still alive and was still you know, the figurehead of the family. But the son was in charge of everything that was there. And the way that this is written, for it to say that he was not aware of what was going on in this little town that was basically their farm, I would think would be a stretch. Even if it was just simply the hustle and bustle of what was going on in preparation for the banquet, of the movement of people out to meet the sun on the horizon, wherever that was, there has got to have been someone, in my opinion, that likely came and told the brother, you're not gonna believe this, but I just saw your father running across town. These are not things that were done. But instead, we get a better picture on what's gone on with the older son and the father. And it's likely, and again, this is my inference, that the older son had watched his father day after day as he went to the fields looking out for the one who had taken his wealth, who had basically asked him to be separated completely from family, from his father, wished him dead, and that obviously had an impact on him. The other side of it is he's not acting as though he were second in command or even in command. He sends a slave in to ask what's going on. He doesn't walk in. This is his house. This is his area. He's responsible for all these people, all this, all this income, this wealth, everything that's going on. It's likely if there's a celebration going on, he should know about it. But he chooses not to. In a sense, he had separated himself and hidden himself in plain sight. He'd gone out to the fields. He had lost his connection with his father. He wasn't involved in any of what was going on. And I believe that was intentional. And to level the playing field a bit in terms of inappropriate behavior and action, after this banquet was called, traditionally the father, being the elder, would be in charge of this banquet. The son should have come in, should have acknowledged his place, 
but instead he refused to go in, which once again crossed one of those boundaries, which forced his father, the elder, to leave his guests, to leave his celebration, and to come out and plead with his son. On top of that, the son doesn't talk about having a celebration with his family and his father. He talks about having a celebration with his friends. There's a deep separation here, and there is a gap. And yet again, the father, compassionate as he is, comes out and pleads with him. If there are two things in this culture you can be assured of, elders didn't run and they didn't beg. Yet this man did because he loved both of his sons. As he pointed out towards the end, he says, all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate because now I have both of my sons back. In one way or another, both sons were doing different things, separating themselves from the father. Both were not showing the compassion and the love that their father had for them. In fact, the older son, it could be said, was very connected to the Pharisees as he was angry and grumbling outside that made his father come out. Just as we see in verse 2, the Pharisees were grumbling at Jesus. So as Christians, when we see this story and we come together in worship, we also come to a celebration. We come to a celebration at the table each week. We come and we repent and we grow and we learn as a community. And we realize that all those who repent are able to approach God. And so what it made me think of is in our own walk, in our own life, especially at a week when we have the opportunity to spend time with those who are on the margin, whether it's the thinnest edge or not, I'm not sure. But those people at night's welcome have a serious need. Are we acting like the Father? Are we showing that com compassion, not only to them, but to one another? Are we seeking that life like the Father where there is compassion? Or are we going off to a distant place like the younger son or hidden in plain sight as the older? The thing that I think it lifts up is not only the Father's compassion, but also that regardless of the parable, regardless of the scenario, regardless of where a person is on the edges, God is big enough for them. Redemption is possible. The most extreme situations, the most extreme margins are not too far away from God. So I would ask, not only how are we acting, are we coming closer to the Father each day in our walk, or are we finding ourselves in a rut like the sons? I think that in summary, N.T. Wright gives us insight on how whether it's this day, this week with Night's Welcome, next week, next month, or next year, how we as a community can turn our faces out from this place after celebrating at the table and go out and find those who would like to celebrate with us. N.T. Wright says, how can we move towards becoming people through whom resurrection happens to others? How can we celebrate the party of God's love in such a way as to welcome not only the younger brother who have come back from the dead, but also the older brothers who thought there was nothing wrong with them at all? Amen.